Good morning. morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I serve as one of the pastors here. Would you join me in turning to James chapter 3 this morning? James chapter 3. This morning we will be looking at and considering together verses 1 through 12. James 3 verses 1 through 12. Follow along as I read God's Word. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed And has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers... These things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we receive this from you as your very word. We ask that you would help us now by your Holy Spirit to understand what we have just read, to understand ourselves rightly in light of what you have said, and to also understand more of who you are and who your Son, Jesus Christ, is for us. It's through him that we pray. Amen. It is easy to underestimate the power of words. There are a number of reasons why this might be the case. I think one is that we just use so many of them. One study estimates that the average person uses 16,000 words a day. So with so many words flying around, you can understand how some people might conclude that, that words are not worth very much, that talk is cheap. Perhaps another reason that we underestimate the power of words is that we tend to think of words as being less substantial than actions. There's that common saying, actions speak louder than words. And the idea behind that is that the things that we say do not count for nearly as much as the things that we do. Perhaps another reason we have a tendency to underestimate words 
is that the spoken word is, by its very nature, fleeting. It's momentary. Unless it's written down, the words that come out of our mouths are there for a moment and then they're gone. Whatever the reasons might be for our underestimating of the power of words, James is determined to help us stop underestimating the power of words. This passage presents an urgent warning and really a plea. This passage says that words are hard to control, they can cause a lot of damage, and so we must use them carefully. That's the message of James 3, verses 1 through 12. Words are hard to control, and they can cause a lot of damage, so use them carefully. This passage has three parts. This, the middle section contains the warning. It's in the middle movement of this passage that James pleads with us not to underestimate the power of our words. And then James puts on either side of that warning in the middle two examples. And so the, the structure of the text is basically an example of the power of words, a warning about the power of words, and then another example. So example, warning, example. That's how we're going to walk through this today. So the first example that James begins with is teaching. The first example he gives about the power of our words is that words instruct and influence other people. This is in verses 1 and 2. Look at it again with me. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So James is giving a command to the Christians he's writing to, saying, Not many of you should become teachers. Now when he says teachers, he doesn't mean teachers in general, he's talking about specifically teachers in the church, in the Christian community. So why does he say, essentially, this isn't for everybody? Well, he says, first, because teachers will be judged with greater strictness. Well, why is that? Verse 2 gives a reason for that. Look at verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So that the hazard of teaching others is that words are required. And words are easy to misuse. Jesus himself warned in Matthew chapter 12 that people will be held accountable on the day of judgment for every careless word that they utter. That's true for everyone. So you can see why James is saying, think twice before teaching other Christians because that's a lot of words you're going to have to use to do that. So there is a particular warning here, a sobering one, for those of us who are pastors, elders, ministry leaders. It's a weighty task. It's also a warning for any Christians who would aspire to those roles. But I think there's also a more general implication for, for all of us because words instruct and influence whether or not you have a formal teaching role. So if you think about a teacher, what are, what are the possible 
ways that a teacher could misuse words. Well, well for example, a, a teacher could speak doctrinal error, which is to misrepresent God. That's a big deal. A teacher could also potentially steer someone in, in the wrong direction ethically, telling them that what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. Someone teaching others can also become guilty of hypocrisy, telling people to live a certain way without actually living that way yourself. And a teacher could also use teaching as a, as a platform for self-promotion. So all those things are possible. Those are all hazards of teaching. But, but all of us use words to instruct and influence others. So, so parents teach their kids. One friend gives advice to another. One person recommends a book or, or shares an article. We, we put words out into the world that impact other people, and we will be held accountable for that. Not least of all, for how closely our lives match the instruction that we give to others. So this is the first example James gives of the power of words, teaching. Words instruct and influence others, and so they should be used carefully. Now we move to the second, the middle section, the, the heart of the warning. This is where James warns us about the power of words. And he says that they are hard to control and they can cause a lot of damage. This is verses 3 through 8. He starts with a couple illustrations, a couple analogies. Look at verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Verse 4, he gives the illustration of a rudder that, that steers a ship. The, the implication is, is pretty straightforward. These are small objects that exercise an influence that is disproportionate to their size. A, a little bit in a big horse's mouth steers the whole horse. A, a relatively small rudder directs this massive ship. And the takeaway of the analogy is clear in verse 5. Look at verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So you can see how James is, is starting with, with a basic principle, which is that the tongue, standing in for our speech, our words, the tongue is small, but it exercises influence, impact that is disproportionate to its size. And so he's, he's starting out this, this warning in verses 3 through 5 in just establishing the principle that our speech has a massive impact, bigger than we tend to assume. But he doesn't stop there. He, he, he builds on that argument in the second half of verse 5 and then verse 6. Look at the second half of verse 5. We get another analogy. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. So this is saying more than just the tongue has a disproportionate influence, this is specifically now arguing that the tongue's power is actually destructive. It's dangerous. The tongue, our speech, the words that come out of our mouth have the capacity to wreak havoc on our own lives and on the lives of others. He compares it to a fire. He says it's, it's the world of unrighteousness, which I think means that the tongue is a vehicle for every form of sin. That there is no 
species of sin that the tongue cannot serve or support or advance. He says the tongue stains the whole body. It sets on fire the entire course of life, which means that our speech can corrupt other aspects of our, of our conduct. He says, finally, at the end of verse 6, it is set on fire by hell, which means that in some sense, the destructive power of the tongue comes from or is helped by Satan himself. So these are sobering descriptions of the destructive power of the words that you and I use every day. And that sets the stage for the the third part of his warning. This is in verses 7 through 8 now. The third part of his warning is that not only is the tongue disproportionately powerful, as verses 3 through 5 said, not only is its power potentially destructive, as verse 5 and 6 said, now in verses 7 through 8, we also see that the tongue is untamable. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So human beings... For all of our powers to domesticate and subdue, we cannot ultimately subdue our own mouths. It's an incredible statement. So with this warning in verses 3 through 8, James is striving to persuade us not to underestimate the tongue, not to underestimate the power of our words. They're disproportionately powerful. They're potentially destructive, and they cannot be ultimately mastered. So our words are powerful. They're hard to control, and they can cause great damage. So someone might say, someone has said, actions speak louder than words. But James would say, that some of our most consequential actions are words. Our capacity for language is, is one of the things that distinguishes us from animals. But it's also the thing that enables us to be more cruel to each other than animals are. Human language is the building block of human civilization, and yet it's also one of the greatest threats to human civilization. With words, we deceive and defraud and cheat and lie and conspire and murder and wage war. Humans need words to cooperate and build a hospital, but humans also need words to cooperate and build a concentration camp. Our words have the potential to be destructive. And so we must not underestimate them. So James has given us an example of the power of words in teaching. Words instruct and influence others. He's given this urgent warning in verses 3 through 8 that words are hard to control and they can cause a lot of damage. And then he ends with another example. This is in verses 9 through 12. So here's another example of the dangerous power of words. Look at verse 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. 
My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So we use our words to bless God. What does that mean? Blessing is simply speaking good to someone, over someone, about someone. To bless God just means to praise Him. One of the greatest duties and delights of being a human is blessing our Creator. But James says we can do that and then turn around and curse other people. People who are made in the likeness of God. So what does that mean? What does it mean to curse someone? Well, most narrowly, to curse means to call on God to bring judgment on someone. But more broadly, and I think this is probably what James has in mind here, cursing is any way that we use our words to harm someone else. This is what one commentator says about verse 9. James probably has in mind a variety of verbal sins that harm our neighbors. Slander, false testimony, gossip, and so on. James accurately indicts sinful speech for what it really is, cursing. In truth, we wish the harm of others and our ill speech expresses that foul desire and works to accomplish it. So James is saying, from the same mouth, we praise God, and then we harm those made in God's image. And so there, there is a, a wholeness that James calls us to, which is to have our words to and about God match our words to and about others. So many times in James, he has diagnosed our problems in terms of being divided. And this is another way in which we are divided, that we have this incredible capacity for language and we can even use that to fulfill our highest calling, to bless our creator, and then we use that same mouth to lie to defraud, to gossip, to manipulate others. And James says, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, one of the rules that we had to implement in our house when our kids were younger is this rule that you're not allowed to draw on somebody else's drawing, which is never a rule that I thought I would have to implement, but it became important because what we had was we had a, uh, usually the older, one of the older kids would just labor over this piece of art. You know, draw it, color it, make it beautiful. And then another sibling, usually a younger one, would come along and just scribble on it. Just, just put scratch marks all over it. And then the scribbler would be surprised that the artist is upset. <laughs> because I was just looking for a piece of paper and there was a piece of paper What's the big deal? And so we had to explain to the scribbler that that piece of paper is not just a piece of paper. It's different than other pieces of paper because your sibling has put their creativity into it. It is now a, a reflection of a part of them. And so for you to come along and just scribble on it, it is to deface something precious that doesn't belong to you. And in the same way, when we use our words to hurt other people, we are defacing people who are made in the image of God. As James says in verse 10, these things ought not to be so. So, what exactly does James expect us to do with this? I mean, at one level, it's obvious. 
He's saying, watch your mouth. Be careful what you say. Use words carefully. But at the same time, there, there is a tension here. Because on the one hand, James tells us it's impossible. It's impossible to master the tongue. And then he turns around and also says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. So if we were to ask James, James, how are we supposed to actually grow in this? If the tongue is set on fire by hell, setting our lives on fire, destructive, corrosive, corrupting, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to work on this? I think what James would say is something like this, that our speech improves as our heart changes, and our heart changes as we trust in Jesus more. Our speech improves as our heart changes, and our heart changes as we trust in Jesus more. Now, why do I think he would say that? Well, two reasons. The first is that I think James would make a connection between our words and our heart because the metaphors that he uses in verse 11 and verse 12 Uh, echo things that Jesus said. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, Matthew 15, 18 says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. So the heart in the, the biblical conception is really the control center of our lives. It's our innermost person where our beliefs and our commitments and our desires reside and operate and really drive our whole lives. And Jesus said, and I think James was aware of this, Jesus said that out of that command center where our deepest commitments, beliefs, and desires reside, from that source flows our speech. So if you want to change your speech, if your speech is in need of change it has to go back to the source. You have to go upstream to the heart. The second reason I think James would say that our heart changes as we trust in Christ is because of what he just said right before this. James 2, 14 to 26. James argued for the inseparability of true faith and good works. Works of obedience to God are the necessary byproduct of a living faith in Jesus. And then in the very next paragraph, our passage, he starts talking about words. So it seems fair to infer that for James, one of our works of obedience is our speech. And that means if you want your speech to be more godly, Ultimately, you need to trust Jesus more. So, our speech improves as our heart changes, our heart changes as we trust in Jesus more. What does this look like? Well, try this. Try this maybe this afternoon. Try to identify one persistent verbal sin in your life. What is one of your reoccurring verbal sins? Then try to identify what is going on in your heart. What what beliefs, commitments, and desires are are driving that verbal sin? Try, Try to make the connection that Jesus says is there. That your words are the overflow of your innermost person. And then, once you've started to identify what's going on in my heart, what are my beliefs, desires, and commitments that that are fueling these words, once you've identified that, apply the gospel to your heart so that embracing Christ with faith actually begins to to alter, to change your beliefs, your commitments, your desires. Let me give you an example. 
One of the things that I was convicted about this week was my tendency to speak harshly when I'm correcting my kids. So, let's take that as an example. Why do I do that? What's going on in my heart so that when it's time to correct some kind of misbehavior, the words come out harsh, sharp, short-tempered? Well, I think a lot of it for me can be traced back to pride. That, that deep in my internal command center, I feel a prideful sense of entitlement. That I deserve to have well-behaved children. And when I don't get what I deserve, I feel not just angry, but I feel personally insulted. And so the words come out with a little bit of spice put on them. I think another way that pride drives harshness, at least for me, is that in that moment of harsh correction, my heart is believing, at least in that moment, that uh, I'm not really that sinful. Like, what's, what's so hard about this, guys? Can't, we, can't you get it together? Can't we just, like, do what we're supposed to do? Like, let's go. As if, as if I don't know anything about being a sinner. So when I come to apply the gospel, how does it help me? How does the gospel start to rewire those messed up beliefs, desires, commitments? Well, there's so many ways, but in general, the gospel has a profoundly humbling effect. For one thing, the gospel just extinguishes entitlement. Because what, what do I really deserve? Right? The gospel tells me that I deserve nothing except God's judgment. And every good thing that I have was purchased at the cost of Jesus' life given for me. So I show up on any given day, uh, in any given situation, deserving precisely nothing. So that ought, to, that ought to unwind some of that prideful entitlement. The gospel also humbles me because it, it reminds me that I'm a desperate, poor sinner in need of grace, which has been provided through Jesus and through Jesus alone. That the only reason that I have any right standing before God is because of what Jesus did for me. He gave his life for mine. He gives his perfect, righteous life to count for me. And because of that, I am right with God. So when I come to give necessary correction to my kids, it can now, if I'm, if I'm actually embracing Christ in the moment, actually believing the gospel at a sort of deep functional level, my correction now should be flavored with humility. Because now I'm remembering that I am just one poor sinner trying to help another sinner. I'm not some like righteous, perfect person stooping down to fix this frustrating person. I'm just one sinner trying to help another. So you, you could do this same exercise with, with any verbal sin, defensiveness, lying. Like, why do you do that? What are you believing? What are you trusting in? What are you after? Identify that and then take that to the cross. Look at it in the shadow of the cross and see if it looks any different. See if embracing in real time the death and resurrection of Jesus for your salvation actually starts to rewire, reorient your heart. And that will inevitably change the words that come out of your mouth. So this passage has, to be sure, a stern and sobering warning. But it's also incredibly hopeful. 
The warning is our words are hard to control and they can cause a lot of damage. So we must use them carefully. But the hope is we are not on our own. We are not left merely to the strength of our own willpower. As much as James is driving home again and again our responsibility to obey God, he never loses sight of the fact that the starting point is not us, but it's God. It's God, the Father of light, who gives us every good gift. It's God who has given us his one and only Son. It's God who loved us before we had any good works to do for him. So use your words carefully and do so with a tenacious trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you this morning. We acknowledge that you are the very word of God. And so all all of our capacity for language, which makes us such special creatures in your world, but which can go so wrong, you embody that perfectly. And so we praise you, Christ. We worship you. And we place our trust in you yet again this morning. We need your help. We need your grace. We need you by your Holy Spirit to change our hearts. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause to rise from this place, from this church family, words that are life-giving, words that are a blessing and not a curse. We pray this through you to the Father, and we give you praise. Amen.